All right, welcome to another episode of Getting High on Anthropology. Today we have a very special guest. Uh, I'm going to have you introduce yourself, give us your name, your title, and the institution you belong to. My name is James Douglas, and uh, I'm a master's student in agroecology at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. And James, you're currently studying hemp in Colorado. You want to tell us a bit about the study and um, what is the objective of the study? My study is to understand the industry as a whole. So that includes hemp as a um, a crop for mostly cannabidiol, but also um, drug type cannabis in terms of uh, THC production. And I want to understand it on many different levels as well as I can in the four months that I have. And then to write something which can communicate that understanding of the industry as a whole um, to anybody who write, might read my thesis. Do you enjoy studying hemp? Yeah, for sure. I chose it because it's a, an unusual and interesting topic. Um, one of the reasons that does make it, it make it um, interesting to be in this industry is that other people don't join it because there's stigma and because they think it's weird and because they think it's drugs and and for me that makes it interesting. It makes it uh, unusual and kind of radical and uh, more fun. So recently you have um, done some field work in Colorado. Do you want to tell us about the field work and what was the purpose of it? I'm studying cannabis, so. That includes both drug type and hemp. And um, what I'm really interested in is rural livelihoods and how farmers make a living. So I see hemp as uh, something that has become, in some ways, very valuable per acre, a very unusual, um, much higher value per acre than other crops because it's being sold for CBD and because it's being grown for THC content. What does hemp mean to you? And um, describe like uh, a couple of the steps that you're taking to get a, a better understanding of hemp. Most people um, watching this show will know that the main cannabinoid people are after when they buy pot or marijuana is tetrahydrocannabinol. And when that uh, tetrahydrocannabinol level goes below around 0.3%, it's different for different countries, but it's usually around 0.3% by dry weight, then... Um, that crop, crop can qualify as hemp. So uh, people aren't using it for um, getting high anymore, but they're using it for fiber, for seed, or in my focus area for cannabidiol production. Provide uh, viewers with a bit more details on um, the field work that you've done, and I believe you're in the middle of it. Uh, what, what are you doing to actually um, go from you know data collection to then this other goal of trying to make the end result practical or useful for people in the trenches? Basically, my project at the moment, I'm doing my thesis, so it's four months long, and uh, I'm in Colorado for that. Actually, I'm in Canada at the moment, but for most of my thesis, I'll be in Colorado. And in the beginning, I started with... Uh, Taking a look at the context, I'm building what's called a system map. So it's a soft system map. I'm looking at the cannabis industry in Colorado, kind of as if it was a machine, which would be a hard system map, in the sense that you have pieces that relate to each other uh, in an economic situation that would be based largely around money. But the map that I'm building has to do with humans as well. So it's a soft system map, it has human pieces in it, and it includes their motivations and why they do what they do. Um, so I began in Denver because uh, that's absolutely a hot spot for pot. And I took a look at the context. So I want to know the actors that were involved, how they relate to each other, and why they interact the way that they do. And then I'm doing case studies. So uh, I'm going to do two case studies in Colorado. I just finished one in Hotchkiss, which was very much a rural producer of hemp. And they're just beginning their business. So I went to them, and it was kind of split down the middle where – I'm a chemist, so I did analytical work for them. They have a gas chromatography machine, and they're having a little trouble using it. So that's why I identified them as a useful case study. I could do something that was immediately useful for them, and it also gave me access to their case so that I could stay on their farm for a month, live with them, and understand their operation. Could you give us some details? Like, what was an ordinary day like for you down in Hotchkiss? Well, I like chemistry, so yeah, that part was fun for me. I spent a lot of my day working with the gas chromatography machine. Uh, troubleshooting it in the beginning, and then in the end, um, figuring out a standard operating procedure so that people can use it when I'm gone, so that um, it's fairly well settled that someone else who comes to the operation and wants to use the machine uh, knows what they can do, and it's all written down. Um, and then it was just fun for me to see really inside the barn and the production. I've never really been around pot operations much before. I studied in the Netherlands hemp, um, but to see the 
indoor hydroponic grow operation that they have was really interesting for me. And I also have a background in farming and food. So that was an unusual grow situation for me to see uh, this very high intensity artificial lighting kind of situation, which is what they do. It's part of their operation for growing CBD. What were the things that you did to end up in Hotchkiss? I have to give a shout out to the National Hemp Agency or no, sorry, National Hemp Association. Uh, they're really great and they are national now, but they did largely originate in Colorado. And um, that's um, just definitely a shout out to the work that people have been doing here in Colorado. And I went to one of their meetings. They have a monthly meeting. So I went to one of them and that's how I met the farmer uh, that I ended up with in Hotchkiss. I was looking for a case study. I talked to people uh, at the meeting and identified this one particular person. And then we had a little discussion after that and they seemed happy to have me come. So I was happy to go. How many days did you spend on the farm? And um, was there one moment that you remember as the most interesting or just something that stood out in your head as something that um, was memorable for you? I was there for about 30 days. My case studies are usually one month long. Um, and I think one moment that really stood out for me is it was right near the end where most of the uh, chromatography work was kind of uh, done. And the owner of the company came to me and said, I'm going to give away some of our product um, to a child who needs it for epilepsy. Their parents have asked me for um, a sample and we decided to give it to them for free. And that was a big moment for me because it was like, oh shit, are we ready for this? Like I've been doing some um, improvements of the whole process and and it was um, kind of a, a, it was a bit scary, I guess, but also a reminder of how it can become a very abstract project. But in that moment, it became very real in the sense that like there's a, a child who's dying from epilepsy who needs this product and it can be difficult and it can be expensive for people to source it, uh, but we can give it to them for free. Why don't you tell us a bit, um, as much as you're comfortable, um, uh, some of the details of what you're going to do um, for part two of your field work here in um, Colorado? Sure. Yeah. And you probably noticed I haven't been that specific about the cases. That's because all the things that I do are anonymous. Um, but that's because the, the legal situation could be a little bit complicated. So when I report details um, in the writing that I do, it will be anonymous to protect anybody who might be breaking the law. Um, but when I go back to Colorado, I'll be working for another month on a farm uh, in northern, northeastern Colorado. And uh, it's, a, it's an organic farm, uh, quite a large one. And it recently had some financial troubles and downsized quite a bit. And now they're, they're considering uh, cannabis as an option. They do a lot of other things as well. They still continue to grow vegetables. So in that sense, it will be a different case study sort of situation. The one that I was at before was very focused on hemp. The one that I'm going to now um, is considering hemp as an additional crop. And uh, yeah, may also be involved in marijuana production, depending on uh, their ability to access kind of the legal framework of uh, of making that happen. And what's the purpose of having two case studies as opposed to one that's maybe more in depth? Case studies uh, shouldn't be considered a, a data point. Like it's not, uh, it's not that you would do a hundred case studies and try to figure out some sort of like graph, um, which you might do in like a physical science situation. A case study from a social science perspective is much more like um, you're looking at qualitative situations and going deeply into the situation to see that you can understand it and then using that as um, rather than a data point maybe like um, a node in a network so then you're making connections out from there and um, that's that's why I chose to do case studies and uh, rather than a survey or something that would gather a larger amount of, of data in terms of like kind of points um, and that's that's an important part of my program I mean it's, it's kind of the pedagogy that we use we do tend to do a lot of case studies and um, it's to give a deeper understanding of the situation. It's to basically look uh, and try to see things that you might never have thought of uh, rather than um, something where you, you have a presupposed hypothesis and you think you understand the situation so you enter it. It's to jump right in and then um, try to find something that you never could have imagined. Give a bit more detail on the steps that you're taking or the methods you're using to collect the data. I take a lot of photos. I'm pretty visually based because I love photography, so I decided to make that part of my thesis. One of my professors years ago told me research is me search. It should be um, something that you like to do and it should be a question that you're very interested in. So I've, I've run with that and um, used photography as a major part of my, um, my whole toolkit. 
And I keep a lot of journals, which is just the classic thing for any researcher to do. Uh, and then I do a lot of rich picturing, which is drawing, which is something that I wasn't very used to before I began this program, but um, I like it now and I have become better at drawing. Um, so in the beginning, it makes you feel like you're a bit of a little kid making these little cartoons and drawings, but they're a very good communication tool and they're a very good way to remember what you've seen and uh, the connections that you've seen in a way that is able to tap into the creativity of a human mind, which I think is one of our best strengths. So people need to, um, as a good scientist, you should be able to use your own creativity of your mind rather than a positivist kind of absolutist view. Um, if you're going to really understand people and what they're doing, then you need to use your human mind. In your conversations, whether with friends or family or even co-researchers, uh, have you felt stigmatized? Like any specific example where people sort of brought something up, uh, maybe poked fun a bit um, about your, your, your topic that you selected? Oh, yeah, all the time. And, you know, at this point, I just kind of let it slide off, you know, because... Well, one of the things that makes it easy to let it slide off is that people in this industry are making a really good living and a lot of people aren't. So when they make fun of you, it's just like, all right, good, make your choice. I'll make mine, you know, and uh, I love it. So that's fine for me. I, I have definitely seen um, a little bit more serious stigma, um, not towards me, but other people have modified their decisions quite dramatically. For example, I found um, a researcher in the Netherlands and she was Mexican and she really wanted to work on him and uh, she would have liked to. But she just told me, I can't. If I go back to Mexico and I told people I work on cannabis, I will never find a job there. So I think for me, it's not that serious and I can kind of laugh about it. But I know that the stigma can be a little more serious for other people. What would you say is one thing that keeps you up at night about growing hemp in Colorado? I guess one thing for me that's a concern is, uh, will the CBD market remain strong? Uh, what will the legislation come out to be? It's such a confusing area right now. I mean, for example, the FDA has given um, warning letters to businesses about selling CBD, but they just continue to sell it. And the, the time period that the FDA uh, has given them in the warning has passed. They continue to sell it. I'm not sure why. Will that continue? Will they get shut down? Will it be given as a monopoly to GW Pharmaceuticals? That's also possible. There's a lot of different things that could happen. And in terms of establishing a business, that's very unnerving. You could put a lot of research and and effort into developing your business and then legislators just take that away and you didn't know whether that was going to happen or not. So that's that's difficult. Yeah, it's a hard situation to be in as a business person. What would you like to see with that particular problem in terms of a remedy to it? One of the things that I really would like to see is to allow it to be um, grown as a gardening crop. I think that it would be really great if people can grow it on a small scale and if regulators could relax about that and just allow it to be a little more free because um, hemp is very strictly regulated in Canada. It's very difficult to grow it. It's actually illegal to grow it in a small plot. You will lose your license if the plot is below 0.4 acres. Uh, and I don't like that at all. I think gardeners have a very important role to play in, in, in just the farming industry as a kind of background and as a, as a backup and as an important part, part of the food system. Um, and I would like to see that open up in the marijuana industry. I know that in Canada right now, it's not allowed to grow your own hemp or pot plants uh, in your house. It is in Colorado, which is great, uh, but there's there's a lot of the situation developing where I'm worried that that will be banned, that individuals can't um, just grow their own plants. And I really value that freedom, especially as a as a researcher. As a scientist, it's just so difficult to, to do research if you don't have the freedom to do it. And and that freedom can, can begin by just allowing people to, to kind of do their own thing in their garden. We covered a lot about your background, the work you're doing, uh, current um, developments in Colorado. Anything uh, we didn't cover or any kind of closing remarks? I guess I'd just like to give a shout out to all the farmers who are really making a go of it. There's a lot of people in Colorado who have had a lot of courage to face this illegal situation, which is uncertain, uh, but they've done it anyways. And they're saying that, you know, hemp has been coming for a long time and they're going to take this opportunity to actually make it happen, which is really great. My name is 
Susan Squibb. I am the cannabis maven in the 20 years of my experience in the cannabis movement and the cannabis industry. I have been a freelance marijuana writer. I have directed operations for many businesses making uh, hash chocolates, hemp ice cream, uh, CBD products. I also have been a very enthusiastic volunteer for political campaigns from the Safer Initiatives to Amendment 64 and even way back in 1999 with Amendment 20, Medical Marijuana Amendment. It started all here in Colorado. I studied anthropology and uh, it was always the projects and additional papers that I would do were always related to the subculture, like hippie subculture. And, and so I was doing the, the hemp cookies, scooping hemp cookies, making hemp ice cream at the same time that I was a student. And I just I really um, gravitated towards that, that it was sort of like being a living example of what I knew <laughs> and, uh, and studying it also. So having one foot in the culture, but then also having one foot on the outskirts so I could always observe what was going on. I think that's one of the exciting things about um, my life is that it's fusing the anthropology and the study of people and, uh, and also helping to cultivate this subculture into the mainstream. Right now we are at Red Rocks Amphitheater and for eight years I had a contract with the city and county of Denver to sell hemp ice cream sandwiches here for the summer concert series. First and foremost it was about sales and marketing of a dairy-free hemp-based ice cream and, uh, and selling, selling that and giving out samples and telling people they could buy them in the local health food stores in the area. And so what I experienced was uh, people wanted to come up and they just wanted to talk about marijuana. And so that was a really interesting um, thing to experience because people, there was still a lot of fear. You know, this was uh, 2004. The most common question that, uh, that I got was, uh, can I smoke it? Can I smoke an ice cream sandwich? Um, so that cheesy joke got repeated thousands and thousands of times. Um, and so I just kind of laugh about it and I, like, ha ha ha, no, you won't get high from smoking. You can't smoke an ice cream sandwich. So I do write that freelance column, Ask the Cannabis, for the Cannabis site, the Denver Post online marijuana website. And, and so what I experience that people are emailing me questions and they want to know, is this true? Uh, what, what are the facts? How do I engage? How do I buy things? Where do I go? They're just looking for resources because there's a lot of information, but they don't really know what's accurate. And so, you know, when I started that, I, I noticed and thought that there's a lot of relevance to what I did here at Red Rocks because people would come up and they would have questions and they would ask me. So I was still, I was answering questions, you know, even then. And so it was uh, interesting that that has carried on, that I'm still uh, at, the, at the forefront of engaging with people that don't necessarily go to pot rallies and, you know, that I'm engaging with the mainstream people that are just attending a, you know, a Kenny Chesney show or a Stevie Nicks show or String Cheese show or Willie Nelson's show and, uh, and just in, in engaging and in, in answering questions and, uh, and talking about a topic that people have a lot of interest in but, um, but have been, you know, fearful in, in really discussing it and so really bringing that sort of out of the closet and being an approachable person that, uh, that they can ask questions. One thing that I really enjoy about the writing the column as the cannabis is that I get fielded and asked so many different questions over different different facets of the industry and uh, in the marketplace. And I think that I really like addressing the social issues. And one that really happened it's, it's, it's come up a couple times where it's about pregnancy and breastfeeding and, uh, or just marijuana use during uh, pregnancy and lact lactation. 
And so I find that it's really um, that there's a lot of fear that is still uh, keeping the uh, the full truth of the spectrum of what actually is happening and what the use actually is. And I understand that there are limitations that, you know, that there is for research, you can't really, you know, we're going to test marijuana on, you know, pregnant women, <laughs> fetuses, you know, there, there are those, you know, moral limitations and ethical reasons why. Um, but with the studies that we do have, um, that there's, it, it sort of, it confuses and it incorporates all drugs into the studies. And so it's really hard to actually know what is the impact of marijuana. Um, so I, I started writing. Um, it was it was sort of the first lesson that I had in uh, in writing for the cannabis because I had been writing a marijuana advice column for the previous year for the Hemp Connoisseur, one of the uh, the local marijuana media outlets, and so that was the foundation that I had was I was already writing a marijuana advice column, and so then I picked up this issue uh, from a, a woman that wanted to know about marijuana use during pregnancy. And, and so I was like, oh, it's been used for thousands of years and Queen Victoria used it for her cramps and you know, some of these like folk, you know, things, these, these facts that, you know, I don't exactly know where it comes from, but it's been repeated so often that it's true. Is it true? And so I submitted this column about using marijuana for pregnancy. And so the editor was like, hold on hold on you can't just say these things and so it was a a reminder to me to really utilize the research skills that i honed in school and college to uh, to really find the facts and and what what is true now and so if anyone knows actually where if, with this fact about queen victoria if they can find that and let me know that would be great because i can't use that until i have a primary source Far, what we have um, in terms of research and what the uh, professional organizations have that they really they, they dissuade and discourage women from consuming cannabis because we really don't know what the impacts are on on uh, for the the long-term health of the children um, but there is I, I think that it's an interesting part in the anthropology is that we're studying the spectrum of behavior and that you have this issue that is still a, a hot topic where you know that that uh, a child could be taken from a family if if, if a mother talks about the use of cannabis, that if a, a, a pregnant woman uh, openly discusses marijuana use with her doctor or in the delivery room, then the child, once is born, will be drug tested, and that that could mean a visit from uh, from social services. It could mean the child is taken away from the family. So there is there is some really severe uh, repercussions for for women being honest about what they actually do. So it really isn't something that is discussed and, uh, and it's something that, that women, um, it, it's more of an informal thing that, uh, that women can, can talk about with their friends. But in, in the discussions that I've had with other women, it's something that they, they feel that it's something that they still need to keep they need to keep to themselves. It's not something they talk about. Some women don't even tell their husbands that they do it because the the, the risks and the the stigma attached to that is so great. But the um, the reasons for doing it is not to get high. It's for the relief of nausea. It's the relief from pain, and it's something that I'm sure that the women are are weighing with great care. That they're not just doing it just because. It's, it's because that they need some relief from a very difficult pregnancy. One issue of uh, marijuana legalization that is uh, a reoccurring issue is sort of this idea that marijuana is harmless. And I feel that that is a... Uh, um, it gets people in trouble when they are new to a recreational market and they're exploring marijuana for the first time in a long time or ever or um, and they 
what they do is that they, they overindulge. They don't really know how to eat an edible or, or dose themselves. And so I really feel like it would be helpful if um, the, the state would have some kind of guideline that would be an equivalent to something that we know. So we know about alcohol and the different kinds of alcohol. So if we had something that was somewhat comparable, so people had some general idea of, uh, of how to ingest and at what duration and what length of time that would be really helpful. So something that would be, this is equivalent to a beer. This is equivalent to a glass of wine. This is equivalent to a shot. So something that would help people in a, in a public service announcement that, that helps so they don't get in over their heads, particularly with edibles or concentrates, and, uh, and they, they can still have a nice time. really know what the equivalent is that you know alcohol is in marijuana respond very differently in the body you know marijuana THC in particular is fat soluble whereas alcohol is you know it, it it's water based and so you know the the way that the body processes it is very different so it's hard to actually say with a certainty of this is what an equivalent to a beer is but I think research is ultimately the obstacle we really need to to research the medicinal properties of it to really identify how many cannabinoids are in marijuana we don't even know it's somewhere between 70 and 108 it depends on who who you ask and and to really unlock the healing potential and the wellness potential of this plant we just need to know know more about it because it really has an incredible potential um, that, that we have all this anecdotal evidence and experience with but we really need to actually unlock it and and get to know this plant really thoroughly so it can do as much good as possible. In 2011, I created a title for myself, a moniker, if you will, called Canvas Maven. It was uh, at a time when I had finished my 15 years of experience with hemp ice cream. And so I wanted to show that I had an incredible amount of knowledge about hemp, about medical marijuana. And so a maven is one of the essential components for taking any idea from, a, uh, from the seed, from the, the first early adapters and making it into the mainstream, into mainstream acceptance. So a, main, a maven is an essential component to mainstreaming an idea and that is one of my missions in this world.